a public intellectual historian prolific writer on cricket ramachandra guha needs no introduction to an audience like this we all know that he has been a great champion of democratic spirit in this country he writes very forcefully and very compellingly about the spirit of democracy his magnum opus books on gandhi was again upholding the true spirit of democracy in this country and we all know that in the 20th century when many nations have become democratic in their governance we also witnessed some of the autocratic rulers like mussolini in the 20s and hitler in the 30s and again uh, to a certain extent stalin in the 40s and curiously enough after a century we have again certain personality cults like donald trump bolsonaro and even here narendra modi in what extent they can uphold the spirit of democracy and whether these personality cults are doing any kind of harm to the spirit of democracy damachandra guha in his speech will with his profound insight he will be detailing this topic to this audience i think and we are all very happy to be with ramachandra guha one of the leading scholars of india so i welcome ramachandra guha to deliver his speech on this topic over to you sir <coughs> thank you dinesh uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in kerala uh, at this wonderful venue uh, the older i get the more difficult it is to travel and the more uh, uh, hesitant i am to go to large literary festivals uh, and apart from my hometown bangalore which also has like this a wonderful citizen festival uh, this is my next favorite festival so for the rest of the year i shall be attending no other literary festival i've done bangalore i've done calicut and those are my two highs and now i can get back to work after that thank you uh, thank you for your kind words i got to speak on personality cults and democratic decline now let me begin with the term personality cult when was this term first used it's not quite widespread you know uh, it's often used in sport a personality cult of lionel messi or of ms dhoni uh, or in uh, uh, in cinema a personality cult of amitabh bachchan but when was it first used it was first used with reference to the soviet dictator stalin by his successor nikita khrushchev uh, in 1956 in the 20th congress of the communist party of the soviet union khrushchev talked about how the cult of personality built around stalin had a damaging influence on his party that is the communist party and the country that is russia and i'll return to this theme that in politics a cult of personality damages the party itself and this may be relevant to kerala and i'll come to it in a minute uh, but also to the country so khrushchev was talking about how the cult of stalin who was general secretary of the communist party of the soviet union from the late 20s till 1953 how it damaged both the party the communist party of the soviet union and the soviet union itself and he said a cult of personality i quote is it was it is impermissible impermissible and foreign to the spirit of marxism leninism to elevate one person to transform him into a superman possessing supernatural characteristics akin to those of a god such a man supposedly knows everything sees everything thinks for everyone <coughs> 
can do anything is infallible in his behavior. <coughs> so that is Khrushchev about Stalin. <coughs> now, other socialist countries have also had their cults. There was a cult of Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. There was a cult of Fidel Castro in Cuba. There was a cult of uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. But this one man, Chavez or, or, or Castro or Ho Chi Minh, represents the party, the country, the civilization, everything. But exceeding all these cults, exceeding the cult of Stalin and Castro and, and Chavez was the cult of Mao in China. And I'm going to read out a quote when Mao was at the height of his popularity in the 1960s in the party newspaper, Liberation Army Daily, on 13th August 1967, <coughs> said this about Mao. This is the English translation, an authorized translation of what the Chinese Communist Party newspaper said about Mao. I quote, it's a long quote, but please listen to it carefully because it has striking resemblances to the cult of personality in India today. So listen to this. Uh, what the communist paper, paper uh, uh, party paper of China wrote about Mao in 1967. I quote, Chairman Mao is the most outstanding, greatest genius in the world. And his thought is the unbreakable truth. In implementing Chairman Mao's directives, we must completely disregard whether we understand them or not. The experience of revolutionary struggles tell us that we do not understand many directives of Chairman Mao thoroughly or partly at the beginning, <clears throat> but gradually understand them in the course of implementation or after several years. Therefore, we should implement resolutely Chairman Mao's directives, which we understand as well as those which we temporarily do not understand. Now, this absolute suspension of disbelief. Now, you will find things similar to this being said and written by Bucks, BJP Bucks on social media today. It may surprise some of you. No, but, but, but please, please, before you clap, Chairman Mao is a hero to many people in Kerala, including your Communist Party. Okay. So, I suppose this is what is called blind faith. At any rate, the miracles attributed to Mao in China in the 1960s make a Hindu godman seem rather ordinary by comparison. Now, I mentioned socialist cults, but the cults of people like Stalin and Mao in communist countries in Europe, in Europe and China were preceded by the cults of Hitler in Mussolini. Mussolini in Italy and Hitler in Germany. <coughs> now, both emerged in settings that were partly democratic. Soviet Union was an authoritarian country. Uh, Communist China was an even more authoritarian country. But Hitler, uh, Germany and Italy in the, at that time, in the interwar period, were partly democratic. Hitler won an election in 1932, and that's how he came to power. And Mussolini also won an election in 1926, though it was partly rigged, it was only partly rigged. So these were partially democratic countries, which had elements of a free press, elements of an independent judiciary, functioning universities. And Hitler and Mussolini, having come to power through the democratic system, ruthlessly suppressed all these institutions and erected a one-man cult around themselves. Now, <coughs> it's almost a century since Hitler and Mussolini dominated Germany and Italy respectively. A century later, the world is witnessing the rise of authoritarian leaders in countries that are at least partly democratic and a partial list of what are, I will call elected autocrats include Vladimir Putin of Russia, Recep Erdogan of Turkey, Viktor Orban of Hungary, uh, and, uh, uh, and Narendra Modi of India. And, of course, to mention an autocrat, temporarily out of favor 
but longing for a return to power, Donald Trump of the United States. In my lecture, next part of my lecture, I am going to focus on the cult of Modi in India. You know, some of what I say has parallels to what is happening in Russia, in Turkey, uh, in, uh, in Hungary, uh, also in Brazil, where fortunately Bolsonaro has gone. In fact, in my view, uh, the most, shall we say, <coughs> positive international outcome of 2022 was the defeat of Bolsonaro. Just as the most negative international outcome of 2022 was Russia's colonial invasion of Ukraine. And I see fewer claps for that, but that's all right. <laughs> so, but there remain a lot of autocrats. Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, Orban in Hungary, but I'm going to focus on Modi for four reasons. First, it is my country. I'm a, as Dinesh said, I'm a historian of India. I understand that country best. Secondly, because India is soon to be the most populous country in the world. Thirdly, because this personality cult has taken place, taken shape in a country that till recently had fairly long-standing democratic traditions. You know, other, other, the other countries I mentioned, like Brazil, Hungary, Turkey, Russia, <coughs> which have cults of personality, have had military regimes, authoritarian regimes, whereas we've had consistently free elections, a free press, for, except for the emergency which I'll come to, for a very long period. <coughs> Fourthly, because of reasons of demography, we are the largest country in the world, most populous country in the world in history, <coughs> the consequences of this particular cult of personality, the cult of Modi, is likely to have the most dangerous and negative consequences for humanity, if it persists much longer. Now, before I come to the cult of Modi, <coughs> I want to say something <coughs> about the cult of a previous Prime Minister of India before Modi, and this is the cult of Indira Gandhi. Now, I won't go into a long uh, historical understanding, uh, explanation of Indira Gandhi's political career, but she becomes Prime Minister in 1966 after the unexpected death of Shastri in office. Uh, in 1967, the Congress is re-elected with a wafer thin majority. In 1969, Indira Gandhi, who till then had no uh, really clear political views, rebrands herself as a socialist, nationalizes the banks, abolishes the princely purses, uh, and acquires control of the Congress party. In 1971, <coughs> she wins a spectacular electoral victory on the slogan of Garibi Hatao in January. And at the end of the year, December 1971, she is prime minister when India defeats Bangladesh and helps create the independent nation of Bangladesh, uh, uh, defeats Pakistan, I beg your pardon, when India the Indian army defeats the Pakistani army in December 1971, November, December 1971, and Indira Gandhi, under her leadership, India brings about the creation of the independent state of Bangladesh. Now, after that, Indira Gandhi became supreme in her cabinet, in her party, in her government. And that's when the cult grew. And of course, the most famous expression of that cult was by, the Congress, uh, was by the president of the Congress party, Devakanta Barua, whose line even the young people in this audience will know. When Devakanta Barua said, India is Indira and Indira is India. Everyone knows this line. But probably the young people in this line do not know that Devakanta Barua was a great Assamese poet. So do not always trust poets on politics. He was a truly revolutionary Assamese poet who transformed, as Dinesh will know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the corpus of Assamese, modern Assamese literature. Now, this line, all of you know, but another Devakanta Barua line, which
which is much less known, but equally striking, I'm going to quote to you. You know, as a consequence of Indira Gandhi's increasing authoritarian tendencies, uh, the great socialist and freedom fighter Jay Prakash Narayan re-entered politics after many decades in social work and started a movement against her government. And in response to the movement, the ruling Congress party organized a rally in Boat Club in Delhi on 20th June 1975, <coughs> at which a million people attended. So this was a rally organized by the Congress party to showcase Indira Gandhi and her leadership. Indira Gandhi, who was prime minister, spoke. And after her, Devakanta Barua, who was a president of the Congress party, spoke. And being a poet, he read out a po poem specially composed for the occasion. And I'm going to read out the poem to you, <coughs> first in Hindi, which is the language in which he wrote it, and then I'll offer a translation. So this is what the president of the Congress party <coughs> says about his prime minister on 20th June, 1975. Indira, tere subha ki jai, tere sham ki jai, tere kaam ki jai, tere naam ki jai. Or to translate it in my less expressive English, Indira, <coughs> we salute your morning and your evening too. We celebrate your name and your great work too. Now, this is June 1975. Fast forward 46 years to September 1921. Now, Mr. J.P. Nadda, now the BJP is in power. Narendra Modi is prime minister. And Mr. J.P. Nadda is president of the BJP. And on the occasion of Narendra Modi's birthday, this is what J.P. Nadda says in an article, signed article in the Times of India. Uh, at this article, which I'm quote, going to quote to you, uh, uh, will show uh, why I do not read, usually read the Times of India. <laughs> anyway, let, let, let that be for the moment. Here is J.P. Nadda on Narendra Modi's 71st birthday. Narendra Modi has evolved into a reformer who passionately raises social issues plaguing India and then effectively addresses them. He always leads from the front in addressing the nation's most complex and difficult problems and does not rest till the goals are achieved. PM Modi is the only leader who has had an electrifying effect on the masses and who, on whose call the entire nation gets united. His stupendous success is the result of absolute devotion to people's welfare and well-being. His only aim is to make India Vishwaguru. Now, this is, uh, obviously he was not a writer like D.K. Barua. He could not compose a verse, but the sentiments are exactly the same. And now, what is striking is every BJP leader in public thinks like this. In fact, one of the most striking demonstrations of the degradation of India's English language media is that in the three major English newspapers of Delhi, Times of India, Hindustan Times, and Indian Express, every week, sometimes twice a week, you will find signed articles by cabinet ministers about the greatness of Mr. Narendra Modi. Right, now this is, I mean, this is absolutely appalling. This democracy requires this. Jawaharlal Nehru did not demand it. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt did not ask for it. Even Margaret Thatcher and Robert, Ronald Reagan never got it. Can you imagine when Ronald Reagan is president, the Washington Post every week has an article by a secretary of state saying, our great leader, he's a Vishwaguru, he has united the country, he has solved corona, he has solved unemployment, he has done this, he has done that. And of course, you have to do that if you want to retain your job. And I mention, I mention cabinet ministers and party presidents because you see it on social media. Those of you on social media know the bhakti uh, that is there on social media. But the degradation of the party where, and the cabinet where the party president and 
the leading, the so-called senior cabinet ministers have to day in and day out publicly proclaim their worship of their seven, seven allegedly semi-divine leader. Now, there are other examples. The cricket stadium named after Narendra Modi in Ahmedabad. Uh, by the way, in having a sports stadium named after him while he's still alive, <laughs> Modi joins the ranks of Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, Kim Il Sung. And then, of course, the COVID certificate, which has been, which has been thrust on all of us, uh, which when you, um, which when you, those of us who occasionally travel overseas, they'll have to show it. It's met with a mixture of mirth and embarrassment. Which mad country has he come from? You know? Is it North Korea? No, it's not North Korea. It's actually India. And we were told it's the world's largest democracy. Now, so there is this extraordinary cult of Narendra Modi. But the important thing to understand is that though in a state like Kerala, in a venue like the Kerala Lit Literature Festival, uh, there may be lots of people who don't subscribe to this cult. Outside this lovely venue, outside this wonderful audience outside this state, many people actually see Modi as the redemptive, transformative, great, visionary leader. So it's important for me as a scholar to understand why, why Narendra Modi is so popular. You know, some of my uh, radical left-wing friends, they dismiss it. This is just a demagogue. He's, he's not that. He's much more. He's, very, he's a very powerful, he's a very popular, powerful, clever, and strategic politician. And if you want to camp, get, come to terms with him, and if eventually we want, in the interest of our country, to get rid of him, we have to understand why he's so popular. And I'm going to now explain to you six reasons why he's so popular. The first is that he is genuinely self-made. He does come from a very humble background, and he's extremely hardworking. He's devoted 24 by 7 to politics. He's always working. He's never taking holidays. Second, that he's a brilliant orator with a gift for crisp one-liners and an even greater gift for mocking opponents. If you want, first, the first criteria for a political leader who wants to take on Narendra Modi at a national level has to be fluency in English, in Hindi, I beg your pardon. Has to be equal fluency in Hindi. Because that's the language spoken, not just by a plurality of Indians. Hindi is the language spoken where the most Lok Sabha seats are contested for and where the BJP is dominant. And he's an absolutely brilliant orator in Hindi. He works 24 7. And this is important for my third reason. As Indian elections become increasingly presidential, <coughs> his capacity for hard work, his commitment to politics, and his brilliant oratory are, will be compared to anyone who opposes him uh, as a potential prime minister candidate, whether it is Rahul Gandhi or anyone else. They have to make sure that they work as hard, they have the same story of Jai Wala to prime minister, and they speak so fabulously in Hindi. Fourthly, as Hindu majoritarianism, majoritarianism increasingly takes hold, Modi is seen as the redeemers of Hindus and Hinduism. You know, uh, all this stuff about how Hindus have always been suppressed, always been conquered, it may not be true, or it may be distorted. Man, many people believe it, and they see him as the Hindu messiah, as a kind of figure sent uh, to save Hindus from ruin and make Hindus strong and self-reliant and powerful again. The fifth reason that Modi is so popular is that he has his command a massive propaganda missionary, the financial resources of his party and government, and of 21st century technology. Because he was so quick to use social media uh, to 
Burnley shall enhance his image. Uh, he was ahead of the game of his opponents. And finally, his native intelligence and political shrewdness. He is an autodidact. Uh, we do not know whether he went to college. No one has evidence of his degrees. There is no MA in entire political science. And he claims to have done his BA in Delhi University, my university, and at the same time to have been underground fighting the emergency. But notwithstanding his lack of formal academic qualifications, he is an incredibly intelligent man. Never underestimate Modi. Either his capacity for hard work or his intelligence. You know, if Modi gives an audience, Abhijit Manaji is there at this festival, right? If uh, he spoke about his, his culinary skills, but he, if, he, if he meets Narendra Modi and spends an hour with him and discusses his work on poverty alleviation, Modi will understand it better than you and me. He'll get the gist of it. If a solar engineer goes to meet him and tells him about solar technology, if a, a proponent of drip irrigation, if someone who's interested in coastal ecology, he is an incredibly clever man. He grasps things very quickly. Of course, then he packages it in a, in a way suitable to him, but never underestimate his oratory, his capacity for hard work, or his intelligence. Of course, that is coupled with the Hindu majoritarian ideology, the resources of the RSS, the BJP, and so on. Now, so that's the reason for the personality cult of Modi. We have to understand why it has arisen and why it has become so widespread. I now come in the I now come in the next part of my talk the consequences of this cult for democratic functioning. The creation of the cult of Narendra Modi has led to the collapse, near total collapse, of five crucial institutions meant to hold power to account. Five democratic institutions <laughs> that are absolutely crucial to democracy have declined and perhaps even totally collapsed because of the cult of Modi. The first is the party. You know, Atal Bihari, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's BJP was a very different order. You had cabinet ministers who were autonomous. Uh, you had uh, state chief ministers who were autonomous. You had a vigorous uh, inter-party debate. That's all gone. So the party is in total throttle to Modi. The parliament Modi is hardly there. Bills are passed in minutes. The speaker and now the, of both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, the Deputy Chairman of the Rajya Sabha, are totally partisan. They do not fulfill their constitutional duties, which is, of course, to be uh, objective and impartial. The press, which has largely collapsed, I've told you about the English language press, but the Hindi press, uh, the Godi media, uh, to use Ravish Kumar's phrase, the fact that he never gives interviews, the civil service, regulatory agencies, the misuse of the ED and the CBI, and the judiciary, which may have collapsed least of all, but is also under threat and is extremely timid. The fact that the Supreme Court has not yet heard the electoral bond scheme properly or uh, passed the judgment of the kind it has done in many cases uh, shows these five institutions are supposed to be independent. The party is not supposed to be the cult of an individual. It is supposed to be an organization in which there's free and fair debate and decision. One person may finally take the decision, but there must be consultation. Likewise, in the cabinet, that's gone. The parliament, how can you pass a, a bill on Aadhaar in 30 seconds or one minute or on some important security issue? That happens. The press I've talked about, the civil service, uh, the judiciary, all these institutions have collapsed. None of them are remotely independent. All are completely in, uh, captured by Modi and the BJP. And the capture of these five institutions uh, is crucial to the creation of other personality cults too. That's what Erdogan, Erdogan has done in Turkey. That's what Orban has done in Hungary. 
That's what Putin has done in Russia, and that's what Bolsonaro and Trump tried to do in Brazil and the United States, respectively. Now, there are two additional features of personality cults, apart from the destruction of, destruction of independent constitutional institutions. There are two additional features of personality cults in partially democratic countries such as ours that I want to mention. The first is the promotion of crony capitalism. You know, we are dangerously becoming uh, like Russia. You know, uh, uh, we are creating an AAP and a Mani plus Adani party. And maybe a few others, you know, maybe Tata, some of the software companies, but there is no level playing field for capitalists. And <coughs> the other aspect of the personality cult is the complete submission of our most powerful and our most wealthy citizens. The more powerful and the more wealthy you are, the least like, more, the most likely you are to praise Narendra Modi in public, to keep your power and your wealth. It's absolutely shameful, the abdication of our top sports people, business people, and film stars to this cult is in striking contrast to Trump's America. When Trump did something awful, you know, the top basketball players, the top film stars, even industries like George Soros would speak out. So that's one uh, aspect of our personality cult that is distinctive the creation of crony capitalism, and the sycophancy of the successful. When demonetization happened, our cricket star, cricket stars and film stars said, it's the greatest thing since independence. So what the hell do they know about economics? But Modi has done it, so it must be supported. The other aspect of this personality cult is that it promotes religious or ethnic majoritarianism. This is true of Erdogan, Orban, Trump, and also Modi. The majority ethnic or religious group is says, supposed to represent the essence of the nation. So in Turkey, the Kurds are the enemy. In Hungary, the Jews are the enemy. In, in uh, America, the foreigners are the enemy. And in India, Muslims are the enemy, seen as being an antithetical or disloyal to the nation. And I think the most recent remarks of Mohan Bhagwat show this. Now, if you want to, all of you are, most of you here are citizens of India, so I see a few welcome visitors here from other countries. Uh, all of you know something about the history of this country. And if I was to sum up the cult of Narendra Modi, in one sentence, I would say, Narendra Modi is Indira Gandhi on steroids. <laughs> Some of us are old enough to have lived through the emergency. Uh, I lived through the first emergency in this period too. Uh, he's, he's Indira Gandhi on steroids in the sense that he has far more systematically dismantled institutions like the judiciary, the bureaucracy, the investigative agencies, far more ruthlessly manipulated his party, public discourse, with the use of 21st century propaganda technology. But he's also far more dangerous than Indira Gandhi, because Indira Gandhi, for all her faults, was not a Hindu majoritarian. She did not believe India is a country for one religion alone. She knew welcomed and gloried in the religious and linguistic and cultural diversity of India. So, <clears throat> I've, I'll make a few points in conclusion, and then we can open up a discussion. Now, the first thing I want to say, and I want to return this point, that there are many cults of personality in India. Many state chief ministers portray themselves uh, as above the party. They do not consult the cabinet including your chief minister, as a resident of Karnataka, as the level of Kerala, I was deeply distressed that when I, I was happy enough that the left front came back to power, 
But when at least three of your best performing ministers were dropped by the chief minister, I knew the reason. I knew the reason. He wanted no threat to his power. He had to be supreme. That's the same with Mamta Banerjee in West Bengal, with Arvind Kejriwal in Delhi, with KCR in uh, Telangana, with Jagan Reddy in Andhra. So every it, so please do not focus your attention on Narendra Modi alone. In many states of India, the party, the press, the civil service is becoming captive to cults of personality, and that hurts the residents of that state grievously. But of course, Narendra Modi is the prime minister of the whole country, so his cult is the most dangerous. But while we recognize that, don't, don't be complacent about the cults developing in your own backyard. Now, in the last few uh, uh, minutes that I have in my talk, I want to say a little bit about how can personality cults be resisted. One is by the example of history. One is by the example of history. That Germany has never had a personal... Excuse me. Germany has never had a cult of personality because they, after Hitler, because they know what it means. In fact, so self-effacing have been their politicians that Angela Merkel did not even have a Twitter account. Right, because they did not want to promote themselves. Now, for those of us who live in India, uh, we have to be deeply concerned about this cult of personality. And I'm going to read out to you Two quotes from Indians from the past that warned us about the dangers of such cults emerging in our country and urged us to resist them. The first quote of mine is a very well-known quote. It comes from B.R. Ambedkar's uh, last remarks to the Constant Assembly in November 1949, where Ambedkar said, we must not lay down our liberties at the feet of a great man or trust him with powers that enable him to subvert our institutions. And then he went on to say, in India, bhakti or what may be called the path of devotion or hero worship plays a part in politics unequaled in magnitude by the part it plays in the politics of any other country in the world. Bhakti in religion may be the road to a salvation of a soul. This is Ambedkar. Bhakti in religion may be the road to a salvation of a soul, but in politics, bhakti or hero worship is a sure sign to degradation and to eventual dictatorship. Now, the Ambedkar quote is well known to many of you. The second quote is more obscure, but equally pertinent. This is from a letter written to Indira Gandhi in November 1969 by Nijalingapa. Nijalingapa was then president of the Congress party. He came from the old traditions of the freedom struggle. And he, was he and his colleagues were resisting Indira Gandhi, making the party a cult of herself. And he wrote to Indira Gandhi, he said, the history of the 20th century is replete with instances of the tragedy that overtakes democracy when a leader who has risen to power on the crest of a popular wave or with the support of a democratic institution, becomes democratic organization, meaning a political party, becomes a victim of political narcissism and is egged on by a coterie of unscrupulous sycophants who use corruption and terror to silence opposition and attempt to make public opinion an echo of authority. <coughs> now, I'm a historian and I'm often asked what are the lessons of history? Actually, history has very few lessons to offer. And one of the few lessons it has to offer is personality cults are always bad for the country that fosters and encourages them. Historians have passed their judgment on the personality cult of Indira Gandhi and what it did to Indian democracy and nationhood. And I myself have written extensively about this subject. The day will come, though perhaps not in my lifetime, when historians will pass a similarly adverse judgment on the effects on India's happiness and well-being of the enduring cult 
of Narendra Modi. Thank you. Sir, it was really an enlightening session for us. A forum like this, a literary festival. We are all keenly aware of the democratic spirit we all have to uphold to be a nation like this in future also. We know that in India sometimes we have this problem of people worshipping or human worshipping. That's there from the very beginning of our history. We have such personality cults. But in politics, it really is really, it, it has really some dangerous consequences. From the history of our world, he has very clearly pointed out how we are heading for a dead end of democracy and uh, autocracy is going to be in power. And we are all uh, reminded of that famous quote, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That's what is going to happen here. And I think now the forum is open for discussion. Mics are available there. If you have any questions, you can. Maybe I can, uh, yeah, that, that, that lady there? From, uh, yeah, you, 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 yeah, yeah, good, yeah, stand up, stand up, yeah, 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 you, 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 yeah, get, get, get a mic there, no, no, that lady there, yeah, please, please, please stand up there, yeah, yeah, please stand up, stand up, stand up, yeah, I get some foreigners out there, yeah, just, yeah, why do you stand up, yeah, yeah, can you stand up, this is easier, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, how do you fight a personality cult when there is an utter poverty of talent on the political landscape? This is my first question to you. So unless there are alternative sources of talent yeah, yeah. which are nurtured and which are permitted to flourish, so, you know, yeah, there is no yeah, way yeah. of fighting okay. a personality so cult. So I, unlike you and unlike Mr. Dinesh, I don't despair. You know, things will come. Personality cults are bad for the country and they are never permanent. Now, I, see, I, I must emphasize, I, this is very important, you must understand this. Okay. Historians are not there to prescribe. Historians are there to study, analyze, explain, and lay their findings uh, in front of the public to use as they wish. Uh, now, if I, if I go back to the emergency, one heartening aspect of <coughs> India today is that unlike in the emergency, many states are outside the grip of the BJP. Social media has sections. So I cannot give you an answer except to say study it, debate, and the young people will find their answer. Yeah, next one. One, one other question. No, 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 no. Next, next question. Yeah, here. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm, yeah. from, I'm, a, I'm, I'm from Australia, and we had the same thing with the previous Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who secretly swore himself into about five ministries. But we were lucky that uh, he wasn't intelligent like Modi, he wasn't yeah. a hard worker like yeah. Modi. So he was voted out at the next election. Okay, okay. But my question to you is you've outlined um, his cult and the negative things in democracy in India. Yeah. So how do you um, fix that? Or how do you, okay, it's, you see, do, do you need to get rid of him or do you need to just make no, no, the institution I I think, stronger? No, you see, it's similar to the last question, but let me make a remark since you're from Australia. You know, there's a long line of foreign heads of state whom Narendra Modi embraced, not just as friends, but physically, and who then lost power. <laughs> they include Bolsonaro, Hollande, Trump, uh, Morrison. Now, unfortunately, he can't hug himself. So we have to look for other ways. But that's, that's on the more facetious side. You know, I think it's important for us to understand the destruction of all these different institutions. What it does to the party. So if you look at the cult, or if you look at uh, the, the Republican Party and Trump, you know, Liz Cheney is, history will record her as a brave and principled rebel because she was a Republican congresswoman who went against the Trump of, uh, cult of Trump. Other people are going against it. If you look at the cult of Indira Gandhi, one of the reasons it collapsed was one of our senior cabinet ministers, Jagjeevan Ram, said, I've had enough and he fought on the side of the opposition. So the first resistance has to be at all levels. It has to be among people like us. There has to be uh, a stiffening of the spine of the press, a stiffening of the spine of the judiciary. You have to have brave and independent civil servants, but you also have maybe popular nonviolent protests. 
but you also have to have within the party. You know, uh, if China had happened too late, you had to wait for Mao to die, and then Xiaoping to say, Mao was 60% correct, 40% wrong. Right. Now, there may be something Modi has done which are probably good for the country. For example, the welfare scheme. You know, maybe it's 30% correct and 70% right. Uh, wrong, right. Uh, but I think this so, and oh, it's important to understand the institutional structure and where these different elements of this institution, starting with the, as starting too, I have to go back to the other gentleman's question, uh, political parties. Now, let me, let me make uh, just a remark. I have not commented on Mr. Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Yatra. Uh, uh, he, I was invited to join, but I did not join because I do not believe intellectuals should identify with any political party. That's my. I, but when the yatra st started, I was sitting in a place many people here know, Koshi's Parades Cafe in Bangalore. And I was approached by a person who was a legislative assembly member of the Congress party. And he told me, I've been reading your uh, articles about the dynastic culture of the Congress party. And he said, the yatra is a good idea, but Rahul should say, I am not a prime ministerial candidate. He hasn't said it yet. On the other hand, all his chamchas around the party have said only Rahul will be prime minister in 2024. Right. Now, so within the party, there must be democracy. They cannot be cults. In fact, half our political parties are cults of personality, like CPM and Pinere, like TMC and Mamta, like uh, uh, Amadi Party and Kejriwal, like BJ, uh, like Modi and BJP, and the other half are family firms. I was shocked when in the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, M.K. Stalin made his son a cabinet minister. How is that consistent, I asked my Tamil friends, with the heritage of Periyar and Anna Dure? Right. So the destruction of the party is at the core. The lack of inner party, the party can't revive itself. Or it is captive to a cult. So all these institutions, we have to find ways. I mean, I can't give you a magic bullet. That's not my job. I'm not a miracle worker. Our prime minister may claim to be a miracle worker, but I'm not a miracle worker. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going up you. Okay. Uh, we said that there's an Indian phenomenon that's a personality cult, starting from very old days. And I can extend that and say even Nehru was yeah. revered, yeah. Gandhi was revered. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So it's a growing phenomenon. Yeah. So yeah. in order to oppose the personality cult, you need ideas, right? So the opposition is not having any proper ideas. So how will you break the personality cult? So I've already said, I'm not here to give you solutions. I'm, he I'm here to help you. Your uh, aid you in our collective self-understanding, right? So don't ask me for magic bullets, right? please. That's the job of our prime minister. Demonetization will remove black money. India will lead the world. This railway line will make every Indian happy. That's not my job. Okay, I'm, I'm here to help you, to work with you in helping our self-understanding of where we are and try to be about it. But you raised an issue which Amit said, an important issue. In religion, bhakti is a route to the salvation of the soul. In politics, is a route to dictatorship. Now, Gandhi was aware of this. Gandhi, this is, I have written an essay on this, uh, based on my lecture, which is published in the Journal of Foreign Affairs, which starts with a quote from Gandhi, and he says, individuals cannot be worshipped, only ideas and principles can. All right. Now, Nehru wrote a famous essay in Modern Review in 1937 under the pen name Chanakya when he was made dictator, uh, president of the Congress, and he won the Congress power in seven out of nine state elections. He was incredibly charismatic. But, and he wrote this article saying what happens anonymously about the president of the Congress, him, the president of the Congress sees these adoring crowds, he sees, he sees himself as an uncrowned emperor, what is he thinking? He was self-aware, because he had studied Hitler and Mussolini. Now, it does not mean Nehru and Gandhi did not succumb to vanity. It did not mean they did not like flattery. Unfortunately, all men like flattery. But they were, had that level of awareness that this was bad for their party and this was bad for their country. Right. 
Now, Mandela had this awareness even more, which is why after one term he left office. He didn't want to be there forever, right? So I think, <clears throat> but you're absolutely right, but the awareness is to come to all of us. What that, you know, whether it is Hindi, uh, this, because we are such a religious culture, I mean, like the, the cult of the god men, I mean, most of them are absolute charlatans, including those who live in Karnataka or come from Karnataka, especially maybe. Right. Our cricketers, the way we make, you know, Kohli and Tendulkar, they be gods, right. So there is an issue with us culturally, and we have to become skeptical about this and overcome it. Yeah, I think we have, yeah, yeah. One last question, or two more? Maybe we have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah, please, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You're here. Yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Good morning, sir. And uh, when we discuss about the influence of personality culture in politics, the understanding that you got from your session is that, not from just now, from also Ambedkar, it is that it is not at all good for being a democratic regime. On the same time, one of the questions that raised in my mind is that, does the personality of that particular person who is going to be that much influential by the personality cult in politics, if it is positive? For an example, I am taking Gandhi. We know that it is after the entering of Mahatma Gandhi. No, I, I, that's a good point. Now, first of all, I, I, I'll make a one, one remark. It's an interesting question. Now, you mentioned Ambedkar. I also quoted Ambedkar. Now, there are also posthumous personality cults. Now, there's a posthumous personality cult of Ambedkar. You can't say uh, error of Shivaji. You can't go to Maharashtra and say anything about Shivaji. You can't go to Bengal and say anything about both. Now, perhaps in this, I don't know what it's like in this state. So, Ambedkar, ironically, was victim to the same thing you warned about, but posthumously. Now, you mentioned Gandhi. I, I have spent much of my life studying Gandhi. One of the most remarkable and underappreciated features of Gandhi was his ability to build a team and to nurture talent and to bring talented young people, men and women, work with them, uh, nurture them, and set them free to do his own thing. So if you look at the most, some of the most remarkable political leaders and social workers of independent India, people like Nehru, Patel, Jayaprakash Narayan, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, uh, Sarojini Naidu, many, many others, they were all found by Gandhi. He, and then they were carried on his work. Now, interestingly, someone mentioned Nehru. Nehru, Indira, and Modi are the three most powerful and charismatic prime ministers of independent India. But they never left behind the team. Because even Nehru, whom I admire quite a lot, so I certainly admire him more than Indra and Modi, did not delegate powers enough. He did not have independent-minded cabinet ministers. He didn't find young people who, who he could say, take it forward after me. Right. So this, and this is true in every sphere of life. I mean, we have in India, unfortunately, authoritarian vice chancellors, authoritarian cricket captains, uh, I hope we do not have an authoritarian director of the Kerala Literature Festival. <laughs> All right. So I mean, this is something, and Gandhi was aware that he is mortal. So he has to find these young people in different parts of India, and then, you know, nurture them and set them free. Yeah. And he was never okay. in power so, also. Gandhi was never in power also. So there was an article in Caravan, uh, which, which is in Modi's shadow, the Supreme, the Sang leader, RSS leader Bhagavad is no longer supreme. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was an article in Caravan, uh, titled, yeah. in, Modi's, in Modi's shadow, the Sangh leader, Bhagavad, is no longer supreme. Do you think the RSS is losing its influence in the government or in BJP? That's a good question. So, uh, Modi has suppressed, uh, has made the party uh, instrument of his will, unlike Vajpayee, but also he has, uh, the, the RSS, uh, I don't know, I'm not from inside the RSS, but the RSS historically has opposed Vyakti Puja. They have historically opposed the worship of an individual, but maybe they think because the RSS, unlike Gandhi, do not believe, uh, uh, they believe in achieving the ends with whatever means. They don't believe in right means to what the end. Could be whatever, they are happy to do whatever they want to do, right? So, in that sense, uh, <coughs> Uh, the RSS 
thinks, let's use Modi instrumentally. Because in 2025, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we will uh, celebrate our century. But let me say one last thing about the RSS. I warned you about Modi. I would warn you, warn you in even stronger terms about the RSS. Ideology of the RSS, I have written this repeatedly. It's a reactionary, bigoted, majoritarian organization. Its ideology can be summed up in six words. We shall show Muslims their place. There is nothing more and nothing less to the RSS. Don't be fooled by any sweet noises. We are modernized. We believe in nothing else. That's all they believe in. And Modi, the difference between the RSS and Modi is, Mohan Bhagwat is 100% ideologue. Modi also believes that, that you have to, have to show minorities and dissenters their place. But Modi is 50% ideologue, 50% narcissist. <laughs> so, on behalf of all the people assembled here, and on behalf of Care Love, we all thank you, sir, for your enlightening session. Thank you very much.